Uh, to start, this is our first remote Windows SIG. I am Huey Poplock. This is the Central Florida Computer Society. It is November 9th, 2014. I'm sitting in my at my computer at home, and you are either at the Central Florida Computer Society meeting today at the uh, Maitland Library, or you're at home joining us on the internet. Welcome. Uh, we have been the Windows SIG chair for about 15 years. We do this on a regular basis. These are relatively, relatively informal. I don't do a lot of practice and I, I set things up. Uh, but we do have a website and I post all of the information. So if you'll look at your at the screen right now, you'll see up here at the top it says Huey.net slash WinSIG. If you just type in Huey.net, it will take you to the website and then click on the WinSIG button. It will take you to the page that has a whole bunch of dates in it. These are all notes from previous meetings. And today is November 9th, so we're going to go to that page. And there are the meeting notes for today. Now, this is an overly ambitious list. We probably will only get to a few of the items, but the nice thing about it is there's enough items here that it can keep you busy all week. If I don't get to all of them, there are links and you can go take a look at the various pages where I'm getting my information from. I am. Uh, this, is this is not necessarily the order I'm going to cover them because there is one uh, I probably am going to stick in after the first one and then we'll come back and uh, 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 go to the second one. The first one is 19 tips every Windows 7 user needs to know. I'm going to open that. Let's see. I'm going to try doing it in a new tab. And then go to that tab. This should work where it goes to the screen, and it looks like it's working. If it isn't, Jack, uh, you should be seeing a Windows 7 bottle of some sort. Uh, which is their, uh, uh, which is just a picture in the article. This happens to be from uh, PC Ma uh, Maximum PC, and there's some great ideas and, and, and tips in this article. Uh, and these are things that are coming from Maximum PC magazine. I know Mike, who's online from home, uh, is a subscriber of the magazine, but many of you aren't. And he may have missed the article as well. I'm not going to cover everything in, in detail, but the details are on the page and you can take a look at it. I know uh, Ted is a big proponent of keyboard shortcuts. And if you like shortcuts or you find them or if you aren't using them, you really should try them. They make things a lot easier uh, and a lot quicker sometimes. And just to give you an example, the Alt-P uh, will automatically uh, uh, activates a new uh, a preview pane of your selected file. So if you've got a, f a file that you're in uh, Windows Go ahead. Did you have a question? I'm not seeing your chat box. Let's see if I can see the chat box. Um, I'm back on again. Did you have a, an, an issue? Yeah. Uh, could you zoom the size of the screen? Uh, let's. I thought I did, but let's do that again. Oh, hang on. I got to get to the right place. Go ahead. A little more. A little more? Okay. It's about all I can get, Yui. Okay, the picture's not going to be clear, but the text should be, are they? Okay, the first one is Alt-P, and what that will do is if you're in Windows Explorer, uh, and there's a picture there, if you uh, highlight it and do an Alt-P, P, it will give you a preview of the picture. 
Windows, uh, hit the Windows button on your keyboard, and either the up or down, uh, down arrow, uh, if your window isn't maximized, pressing those up and down will fill your entire screen. Down will minimize it, so it actually will go away. Uh, Windows Shift, holding the Windows key, the Shift key, and the up arrow, or the down arrow, will vertically stretch a window to the maximum desk type height. So you can change the size using your keyboard without uh, clicking and dragging. The magnifier is a Windows plus a plus sign or the Windows and a minus sign. Well, that's what I just did to make it bigger on my screen. Yui, yes. Yui, Yui, hold on a minute. Would, Yui would yes. like you to shut down off of the Internet, please. Everybody. Because we don't have bandwidth in here. And if everybody gets on here on their own computer, we're going to have a problem, okay? It will not work. We tested this the other day, okay? So are you, you're not on anybody else on the Internet? Okay. All right, Yui, we got, we're back to square one. I'll shut off my mic, okay? Were you having an issue? Well, okay. Anyway, uh, another one is uh, the windows and, and left and the windows and right. Uh, those will make your active window fill up exactly one half of your screen and uh, uh, depends on which one you use which one it'll do. Windows Home Key uh, minimizes every window on your desktop except the active window. That's a neat one because a lot of times you've got a lot of things on the screen and you want to minimize everything but uh, leave the active window on and this, this will allow you to do that. Uh, Windows T, like Alt-Tab, uh, still one of the best, will cycle through the various thumbnails uh, on your open programs. Uh, just uh, I'll do an Alt-Tab here. I don't know if this will work or not. We'll try it. Uh, no, you. the way I've got it set up, you won't see it. Uh, so let me go buy it and back to there. All right. Uh, because I'm only showing... The uh, active program, you don't see when I do an alt tab. All you saw was some hash marks in a box. So that didn't uh, come across to you. Uh, Windows P, for right now you're in a room where there's a projector. If you have a second screen, you can also, uh, whether you have a projector or a second screen, you can use the Windows and the P key. And that will change whether it's computer only, whether you duplicate on the two screens, whether you extend it or you just make it the projection only, uh, which would be the second uh, screen. So you can actually shut off your main screen and turn on a second screen using the Windows P key. There's a Windows Shift, uh, and, uh, so you hold the Windows key down, the Shift key down, hit the left arrow, or hit the right arrow, and uh, that'll switch you from one screen to the other. And then the Windows number, so Windows 1, 2, 3, so if you have multiple screens, uh, let's see, no, multiple programs, you can uh, go through the various programs that are on your screen. Windows Space, uh, let's see, Windows Space. Uh, okay, so that's, that's it for the shortcuts. Let's go to the next item. Track your actions with the problem step recorder. I'm not sure whether you realize it, but any time built into Windows 7, uh, and I believe in 8 as well, I've not tried it in 8, you can track your actions by uh, something called the Problem Step Recorder. And it's a tool that you can turn on, and you launch it from the Start menu by typing psr.exe in the search field. When you do that, you hit the Record button, and the applet will track your mouse and keyboard input while tracking the screenshots that correspond with each new action. When, you're, when you stop the recording, your session is saved to an HTML slideshow recreating your steps, to which you can then add comments, annotations, and this tool is useful if you want to create a tutorial or if you need some help and you want somebody to see what's going on your screen. So tonight, when you get home after the meeting, uh, that might be one you want to take a look at, is that step recorder. It'll help you annotate exactly what steps you're taking 
when you're when you're doing something. Uh, mastering a new f the font manager in 7. The font manager is much improved in Windows 7, and uh, I'm not going to spend any time on here. Most of you uh, just use the fonts that you would normally use, but if you need to change your fonts, and I don't recommend it, and I don't recommend adding fonts as well, but if you want to, you can. Let's go to the next group of articles or items in this article. Uh, if you're into games, you can launch the games with keyboard strokes. And this article, this part of the article will explain what you can do there. Um, and I don't use this, but uh, you can actually launch any application by mashing the Windows key and typing its name into the start field menu. So you can, uh, you can set up... Um, the scheme prevents you from starting a game from the start menu. But you can set it up so you get a, uh, 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 a quick start for games. This is one that a lot of you may not be aware of. That if you, get a, if you download an ISO, if you're going to play with Windows 10 and you download the ISO file, which is, a, which is an image of a CD or a DVD, Windows 7 comes loaded with a DVD and CD ISO burning application. You don't have to go download a program to do that. Just double click on the ISO file and Windows will start an, uh, a tiny program that will help you burn the disk. It's a bare bones app, but it works. The next one has become more widely uh, word worldly with hidden wallpapers. There's a lot of wallpapers available and uh, this part of the article will explain how you can go in and change the wallpapers that you use. Uh, I'm not going to get into this too much. The uh, take control of the user access, uh, the user account control. Let me uh, full screen this so you might be able to see it a little better. But choose one to be notified about changes to your computer. Your user account control prevents potentially harmful programs from making changes to your computer. Tell me more about user account control settings when you click on that you'll get more information but you can have it notify me only when programs try to make changes to my computer but you can have it so it always notifies or never notifies so sometimes when something is going on you might want to make sure you have that turned on so you can see if somebody else has got control of your computer or a program is do it just doing some strange things um, Here's another tip and trick. Calculate your mortgage and other math tricks. Uh, I'm not sure if you realize, but your calculator is quite worldly and does a lot of different things. The calculator applet has been beefed up to do more than just basic arith arithmetic. You can toggle between the san standard, scientific, and program, and even statistics mode. And you do that... Uh, from the from the view, and you can have different views. You can even calculate the date difference between two dates using the basic calculator that's built into your Windows 7. Reveal all of your drives this is another good tip. Normally, it says don't show hidden files or folders or drives in your uh, set up for your folder options. All you have to do is change that to show hidden folders and files and then you'll be able to see things like uh, uh, various if you've got a a, 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 a plug-in for different SD cards and so on if it's empty, you won't see the drive. If you have it set, you'll see a, a drive C or E, I should say, or E or F, or whatever it is. And what you'll be able to do is to uh, uh, add, uh, you'll be able to see when you push one of those in that there's something in that drive, whether it's full or not. Okay, I'm just checking the chat box to see if there's any questions, and so far, none. So 
Uh, so you don't have to go into the device manager and properties and so on to look at your printers and devices. You can do it uh, uh, by having the, uh, uh, let's see, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, for the card slot, you'll be able to see what you need. Now, also use devices and printers to quickly dig into your hardware, as opposed to going to the device manager and then properties and then the menus for the devices. Just do it through the uh, use devices and printers. Calibrate your notebook's text and color. I won't go through this too much, but it's a way to calibrate and make sure that you're getting the best picture on your laptop or notebook. Uh, the autoplay. Some of you, when you put a CD in, uh, the CD will start playing. Sometimes it won't. And, and some computers it does and some it doesn't. Well, those are all from settings. So you can go into the control, uh, control autoplay in the hardware and then autoplay and you can set okay do you want to import songs using itunes uh you, you want uh, enhanced audio cd for uh for media under dvd movie do you want it to uh, uh play a dvd movie using the uh, windows media player uh and there's drop downs for other choices so take a look at that if it's not doing what you want it to do, if it's if you put a CD in and it always comes up with a screen that you just shut off every time, well, there's a way for it not to do that pop-up anymore. If you have, uh, uh, be careful of this next one. If you have uh, an external hard drive uh, and it's uh, it's an old drive. And it's not an NTFS, and it's old FAT32, and for whatever reason you want to change it, you can actually convert it. This part of the article will explain how to do that. What about using uh, recordings for use with Vista and XP? Uh, again, if you want to use the Windows Media Center uh, and want to save out the files, there's some ways to convert a TV recording from the media uh, from media player to a DVR MS uh, by using a conversion utility that's provided in Windows 7. I've never tried this. This is what I learned from the article, and I've not done it yet. Command Windows 7 to generate an energy report. And what you do is you just go to your. Uh, let me make this screen bigger so you can see it. You, you open up your command.exe by just going into your start box, into the search box, type in cmd.exe. It will open up your a DOS window. And in it, you will, it tells you, uh, type in the power config dash and then space and then minus sign energy. It will bring up something like this. Let's see if we can get it to come up. There we go. It'll come up like this with an energy uh, diagnostic report. So for those of you who want to take a look at something like that and have the interest to do it, that's a nice way of doing it. Uh, just give me a second here. Oh, I see we've added a few people to the uh, to the group uh, online, and welcome for those of you who joined late. Uh, this is the first article that I've, I'm going through right now, and uh, and there's a link to it on the website, and I'll go back to where the website is in, in, before we end the session. Uh, if you need Vin, uh, Vista's taskbar, there's a way in which you can do that. Uh, and go back to the taskbar and start menu properties. And there's all kinds of things that you can set up on your taskbar and in the start menu, as well as toolbars in the, uh, uh, just go to your uh, taskbar at the bottom and right mouse click and open up properties. And that's not the one I want. Let's see, how do we get to the taskbar and menu properties? 
Right click the taskbar and hit properties and you will get that. You go to right mouse click and then properties. It'll bring it up and you can go to uh, go to the toolbars and, that, and the taskbar and you should see lots of information to help you. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm looking at it on this computer and I'm saying, why does it look different? And I forgot that I'm on an 8.1 computer. Well, anyway, so if you're on a Windows 7 computer, you can just do that. It doesn't work in Windows 8 quite the same way. Okay, if you want to exile programs to the system tray, there's a way of doing that. All active programs show up as icons on the taskbar, whether you want to or not. Well, this is useful for web browsing and word processing. Your taskbar can get cluttered with icons you would normally expect to be hidden away. And those, uh, like those for stream or chat, a chat client or something. So what you can do is you can keep active instances of these programs hidden away in the system tray in the notification area, also known as the notification area, in the bottom right-hand corner by right-clicking their shortcuts, navigating to the compatibility tab, and selecting Window Vista under the Compatibility Mode drop-down menu. Just be aware that this only works for programs that would previously hide away from the taskbar in Vista. Uh, this tells you how to manage your jump lists, where things go. Uh, and I frequently change the way this looks on my computer. You may want to do the same thing. The jump list, which is a sh list of shortcuts, to files or tasks in a particular start menu or taskbar item is one of the most significant improvements in Windows 7. And yet most of us just use the way it came out of the box. But you can make some additions and changes uh, each time you open a file by default, each time you open a file or a website or run a task uh, with a program that supports jump lists, Windows 7 stores that shortcut to the file uh, website or task for reuse. Unlike Windows XP, however, Windows 7 doesn't group these shortcuts into a single lo uh, location. Instead, it stores the shortcuts for each program files and so on in a separate shortcut list, aka the jump list. So see the jump list for a program in the start menu, simply click the right arrow icon. Uh, to see the jump list for a program in the, uh, on, on the taskbar, right click the icon and so on. So, And then you can organize your taskbar and system tray as well. Uh, the programs you pin on your taskbar can be moved around in any order that you want, whether they're a shortcut icon or certainly an active application. So uh, what I do is uh, I like to keep my browser icons together on that taskbar. And so that's what I do. The taskbar is unlocked. You can also, uh, they can be dragged to latch to the left or to the right, or even at the top of your desktop. So you can take the whole taskbar, move it to the top or to the sides if you wish. I generally keep it at the bottom, but I like to be generic and have it the way most people look at it. But there are some times you just want it out of the way. And what you do is you right mouse click on the taskbar, make sure it's unlocked, and then you find a blank spot on the taskbar and then move the whole thing to the right or to the left or to the top. And you can then move it back too. And then if you want to keep it that way, just lock it. And you can, and that will stay where it is every time you start your computer. Um, this accelerates your start menu. I'm not going to go into this too much. But I would, it, if you want to learn more about this, go ahead and go to this link and take a look at these. Uh, arrange files by file type, month, and, and, uh, or artists, and other. So depending upon what you're looking at, uh, when you're in your fo uh, folder list, uh, you just do the drop down, and then you can get either folder, year, type, length, name under uh, videos. If it's a regular uh, uh, file list, you can arrange them. If you're in details, you can just click the uh, the heading and it will change them. And you can pin folders to favorites and start menu. So if you want a whole folder in your uh, favorites, you can do so. Uh, explorers 
jump list shows your seven most frequently visited folders, but you can manually bookmark some of your favorites to the top of the list by pinning folder locations. Just right click any folder, either on your desktop or from an instance of Explorer, and drag that folder to the Explorer shortcut on the taskbar. You'll see a message that reads pin to Windows Explorer before you release the mouse button. The folder will appear under a pinned section of the jump list and you can remove it by clicking unpin from this list. Uh, you can also right click and drag a folder directly to the start button uh, to that folder uh, to the general start list. So there's quite a bit you can do. Um, I'm going to just look quickly at five, but there, I think we're pretty much, you're going to have an OS in your pocket. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but you can format your USB to a uh, bootable drive and actually have a drive uh, on your uh, S, uh, your uh, USB key or USB drive, and uh, and this tells you how to do it. You can partition it, and so there's some information and format away on it. Just make sure that when you do things to your USB drive that that's what you're on and not your hard drive. So I'm not going to spend any time and I don't, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do this. And uh, I am now going to close this and come back to our meeting notes. Okay, uh, we'll go back to the chat box, see if there's any questions. I don't see any. Uh, Jack, if there are any questions, turn the mic on and, and ask. And then we'll go to the next item. If I don't hear you turn it on, that means there's no questions. I guess there's no questions. Uh, Jack, if you would, would you type in how many people are in the audience? Uh, occasionally, just type in a number and hit enter in the chat box so I can see it. I have an idea who's there or how many are there. We do have right now online, just so you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoops, I just clicked on something I shouldn't have. Looks like we got about seven people online, and that was me that caused that. Sorry about that, guys. I'll come back. Okay. Uh, what I want to do here next is I'm going to drop down to a different article. It's not in, in, in line. But I like this article, How My 98-Year-Old Grandfather Embraced the Internet. I'm not going to read the whole article to you, but I will go to it and just take a quick look at it. Some of us are in the gray-haired part of our lives, our life, our lives, our life. And, uh, but we do know some people are even older than we are, or even some people our age. And for, and for those of you who are younger who are watching this and need to help your parents or grandparents, this article is a good article to read through. And this gentleman who wrote the article said um, he received an article from his father. It said, another mystery for me. Do I have Twitter? Should I have this account? If so, what's it for? How do I set it up? Thanks, Grandpa. Well, that was the email he received in September from his grandfather. He was formatting, format, forwarding a message he had gotten from Twitter that he has an account there. Uh, but he doesn't often use it. And he, and he wasn't content to let the email just sit there. He wanted to know what, what it was and why. And we do know some people who do that as well. As a result, he got really uh, good at the, at the internet by doing these sort of things. But, uh, Sometimes it's more than he needs. I, in the article, it shows a large button keyboard. If you have somebody who is visually challenged that you're trying to help with a computer, this might not be a bad idea uh, of purchasing. Or you yourself have problems with your keyboard, uh, this might not be a bad idea as well. A large key keyboard. Anyway, so he, he went on and he talked about his grandfather being in front of the computer. You can see there's his grandfather in front of the, it's, it happens to be a Mac, but it could be a PC. 
But the article goes on and talks a little bit about helping his father, his grandfather, and some friends, and and how they did it. Great article, worth a read. You might want to pass it on to your parents, grandparents, or friends who are reluctant to learn about the internet and to use a computer. This is a nice article for them to read. So even if they don't have a computer, you might want to print it out. So I just wanted to pass that on to all of you. And then let's go back up to the next article. I'm not sure how many of you are using Windows, I'm sorry, Office 2013. I had it on my laptop, on my desk, yeah, my laptop, but not on my desktop. I was using uh, Office 2010. But I just got a new computer. It's Windows 8.1, and I decided, well, if I'm going to go that route, and there were some other reasonings behind it, I went ahead and purchased uh, Office 365. Office 365 is a version of actually Office 2013, but it's in the cloud. The only thing you get when you purchase it is a key and the right to have five licenses on five different computers for a hundred dollars a year it's cheaper than buying the the Microsoft Office and then updating it every year or two years when they update it to a brand new version and with that 100 uh, for that hundred dollars you also get one terabyte of OneDrive space for each instance of the uh, of office so if you each person that you put Office 2013 on their computer, that person will get a one terabyte cloud drive at OneDrive.com, which is fantastic. In fact, one of the other articles that I have on this list is saying that Microsoft is actually upping the one terabyte limit to unlimited. So you can store everything out on the clouds as well as on an external drive or or uh, some kind of external storage as a backup. So uh, you don't want to do it all in one place. So this is a way to have it stored up at a, at a site uh, where you've got unlimited space. But getting back to, to the article, this happens to be from Tech Republic, and I'll open it as we're, uh, uh, as I'm working here. And this is how to edit a PDF document in Word 2013. I started uh, uh, looking when I first got this new computer. Well, gee, what am I going to use to uh, open a PDF file to be able to edit it? And I do, I, I do use and I do like uh, uh, Adobe Acrobat, the main the program that sells for several hundred dollars. But I also like something that's quick and easy to use occasionally. And Windows, or I'm sorry, Office 2013, specifically Word 2013, gives you the opportunity. You can take a Word, a PDF file and Word and open it as a PDF file. So let's take a look at this article, and it tells you how to do it. If you don't think you're familiar with the PDF, uh, PDF format, you're probably familiar with its icon, and that's with the Adobe PDF. And it's called an Acrobat file. To open an whoops, to open a uh, PDF file in Word, you open up Word, and then you say you go to the file and you say, "Open, I want to open a document." You change it. Uh, you point to the PDF file and you say, "Open it." So you go to the file menu, you choose open from the left panel, you, you, you find your quick access, uh, to, or find the quick access toolbar. Once you find the PDF file, you just click and say open. You select the file and open. Then the word will come up with this box. Let's see if I can, if this will come up bigger. Okay, let's see if, by me enlarging it, it still may not help, but we'll try it. I don't know if you can read that or not on your screen, but it says Word will now convert your PDF to an editable Word document. This may take a while, 
The resulting Word document will be optimized to allow you to edit the text. So it might not look exactly like the original PDF, especially if the original file contained a lot of graphics. But you will, I'm going to just bring this back down just a little bit so we can see all of the web page. But so when you click OK, Word will display the protected view bar at the top of the document. And then all you have to do is cl uh, click Enable Editing. And, and once you do that, to edit the file, you'll need uh, uh, Adobe Acrobat, uh, which is a pricey piece of software. If, if you open this file using Adobe Reader, you can't edit it. But, uh, but when you do open it with Word, you can start editing. Again, it may not work, look exactly like the original document. But you can still edit the text. You've got the pictures there. You can take the pictures out. You can do whatever you want. And, and, you're, and you've got all of the information in something that's editable. You can then maneuver it, change it back to whatever you want. So when someone says you, sends you a PDF file, you don't have to say, hey, I need the original file to make changes in that. Well, you've got it. And you can then use it for your own purposes. Now, to save a PDF file, in, in Word, or even any Word document, all you do is when you click and do a Save As, the default is a Word document, which would be a .docx, but you then click that drop down. You'll see a whole bunch of choices, and one of them is a PDF. You can do that in, in, in Word 2010 as well. You choose the type of document, save it as a PDF, and it will retain the original document, and it'll also save it as a .pdf, and you'll have a PDF of your file. So if you have anything, you do any kind of document in Word, and you want it to save as a PDF, you can do so strictly by in Word going to a save as uh, Save the type as, change the type to a PDF, and go ahead and save it. Uh, the author of this article gives uh, some advice. Uh, Windows or Word 2013 converts editable text. That means some elements of the PDF won't appear as you expected, nor will you be able to edit them. Some interact interactive PDF elements won't display at all, and some and not all text will actually be text. Sometimes it'll change the text into a graphic, uh, so it'll be a picture, and so you can't really edit it, edit that from within Word. So just be aware of that. Uh, and Word says, send me questions, that sends him, him questions. I don't have a lot of answers on this. But uh, I think that's a great tip uh, and something to have in the back of your mind, especially if you're using 2010, you can use the uh, uh, you, you can use the save the document as a PDF, but you can't open a PDF in Word. But in Word 2013, you're able to. And by the way, Word 2013 is a free program out on the web. So you can go out, but I'm not sure whether the free version will open a PDF or not. So uh, that's worth uh, taking a, uh, some time and, and trouble and taking a look at. Okay, Let's, uh, I don't see any questions posted in the chat box, and I'm not hearing any. Uh, Jack, if you need to break in with any questions, Jack, why don't you uh, break in? Let's just chat a bit. Jack, I'm hoping you hear me. Yep, Jack, uh, you're muted. Unmute the computer, and let's uh, see if there's any questions from the audience, and let's see how this is working before we continue. Jack, can the audience hear me? Hello, Jack. Hello, CFCS, are you hearing me? Anybody at the CFCS meeting, can you hear me? Okay, now I'm hearing you. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Now I'm hearing All you. Right. Uh, how many people do you, do you have some audience now? I have about 15 right now, counting myself. Oh, that's great. Uh, is this working okay? Yes, it seems to work fine. Does anybody have any questions about it? I have a question. Do you hear me? Barely. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Stan. What's your question? Yeah, my question is, why are there two mouse pointers moving around on the screen? Because my mouse is on, and I'm trying to keep it down on the bottom. Okay? okay? That's why there's two mouse pointers. The one in the center with Yui's little picture thing is his. Oh, actually, that, we, dropped some cheese. That? we dropped some cheese on the screen, and the mice are going after it. I, I can shut my mouse off. But, see? And this is my mouse. Okay, let me shut mine off. All right, now go ahead, you show me yours. Oh, mine's off. I'll show you mine. Uh, I don't see it yet. No, mine's off the screen. All I see is a bunch of colored pictures on here now. Windows. Oh, you see it now? Uh, no. Hold on a minute. Let me put my mouse back on. See if that has anything to do with it. Yeah, you show desktop. Uh, yep. That looks much better. Okay, well you clicked it somewhere when you moved it down. Oh, it just put it over in a corner somewhere so and just because yeah, that's why I tried to keep it. I was trying to keep it off the screen. Go ahead. Okay. All right, I just want to make sure everything is working all right. I haven't heard from anybody and uh it's kind of lonely here sitting in the room by myself when I'm used to looking at people in front of me and seeing how they're reacting. Uh Bob. Wait a minute, Bob has a question. Sure. All right, here's the, it's about a previous topic. When you showed that flash drive, which you could load um, a copy of. Jack, I, I heard, I'm hearing his voice. He wanted, to know, about, if you can repeat he it wanted to know about the flash drive where you could load a, um, a uh, what, what did you say on there? Operating system on the flash drive. Right. If you read that article, it'll tell you how to do it, and you can make a bootable flash disk, uh, flash drive, and then use it on a computer uh, to test it or for whatever reason. But remember, when you boot it like that, it may still see the other drives, and you may cause some problems. But if you've got a, a, an older computer, or you've got a computer that you want to run Windows enough to bring up uh, uh, Internet Explorer, try to make it connect and connect to the internet you don't have to involve the computer uh, hard drive at all so it, it does work is it legal is it legal i'm not a lawyer you ain't i'm not a lawyer i'm only acting as one on the screen so i have no idea basically what you'd be doing is setting up a like you would set up a recovery disk time type flash drive, right? With a startup on it? Yeah, I, I think taking if you own the operating system and you put it on that drive and you're using it yourself, uh and you use it on that computer for instance, or another computer, but you're not using them at the same time, probably there's not an issue. Uh if Microsoft is watching this, uh have your lawyers contact me and let me know and I'll pass it on. Uh, the only the only thing is you you couldn't use that to use in a business or anything. No, absolutely. Uh, and you wouldn't want to equipment. Use it. It's only your own use. Yeah. But you might want to use it to see if well, uh, my computer is not working right. Is it the operating system? You know, is it my hard right. drive? Right. So, uh, so you can boot up yeah. and then see if your computer is working okay. If it is, then you know what? Oh, gee, is that either right, either wrong with my hard drive or? With the data that's on it, or the programs that are on it. Betty Ann has a question. Hold on a minute. Sure. Uh, Huey, what about the keys? Would you repeat you that, Jack? Do you need the key if if you use that uh, that USB drive, and you put an operating system on there? Do you need the Microsoft key to use it? No, because you, you're you're making the copy on that USB drive from your Windows, and Windows is installing itself with that same key, I believe. I don't think it's going to ask you for the key. You're not installing it. You're uh, 
creating another instance of it, I believe, is what you're doing. So he's making a second bootable drive. Right. You're making a second bootable drive, right? Yeah, I believe that's what you're doing with it. With the same operating system. Yeah, one would be on your machine and the other one would be on the USB. But, right. But, okay. And, I th and it's making it from that version, so I don't think you need the key. You're not okay. installing it from scratch. Uh, Mike, you're on there. Uh, let me switch to the chat box. Do you know? Have you ever tried it? He may not be sitting in front of his computer watching it. So. I don't know. He was on there earlier, but I don't. Yeah, yeah he's he's probably got it on in the background. He may not be listening to what we're saying. So uh, okay. that's fine. Uh, uh, but to answer that, I don't think it's necessary. I think it will just create it. I, I, and I think I've tried it. And I believe it, it did not ask for the key. Okay, uh, let me go on to the next item then. Uh, before I do, is there anybody in the audience uh, who wouldn't... Oh, let's see, how do I want to say this correctly? Uh, Jack, uh, by show of hands, how many there are interested in me covering anything about 8.1 right now? 8.1? I'm going to be one, two, three, okay. four. Uh, okay. Yeah, about four or five. And we got about, it uh, looks like about ten minutes, okay? Oh, okay. It's only ten after two. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We, okay, got, we I'll... got some people who are interested. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it. How late do you want me to run so I can time it? Uh, hold on a minute. You indicated to me get rid of that download Oh, uh, a friend of mine came to the meeting, Ed, and he was he had uh, he had Windows 8 on his computer, and I said, "Well, soon you're going to be putting 10 on because they're skipping nine," and uh, that's what he's asking me. He says, it's probably a year away. I wouldn't worry about it at this point. Okay. All right. Make he heard you. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you're running 8.1 and not eight. If, if you need to do all of the updates for eight as uh, most of the newer computers now are coming with 8.1 on them, but always do the updates. Uh, they're all security updates, and there are things that need to be done. Okay, let's. Uh, I, I'm going to do the best uh, start menus. You can go ahead and mute, Jack, unless there's any other questions. I'm getting the battery is running low, and I don't understand it because it's plugged into everything here. Make sure I don't know what's going. Make sure the there's there might be a switch on the um, if, if you've got a plug it's plugged into the wall. Make sure that there's if there's a switch on the extension or the uh, strip power strip that that power strip is turned on. Everything looks good. I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, pardon? Hold on a minute. Is it plugged into your computer good? Hold on a minute. Yeah, and, and the and also check the block. There's a it sometimes gets loose in the block too. Okay. Hold on a minute. We're, we're setting up some speakers of mine I just knocked down. Okay, it looks better now. Is it charging? All right, we're all set. It's all set now. Okay, it's charging. Yeah, it came, out of the, it came out of the brick. Okay. Good. Okay, all now. Right. All right. Go ahead and mute, and I'll go to the next item. All right. All right, the next item, uh, for those of you who came in late or joined us late, uh, on my website, which is Huey.net, and you can see that up here, Huey.net, and uh, if you're at home, you probably can see it, but you may not be on the screen where you are at the meeting. It's H-E-W-I-E dot -E net. You'll go to the home page. On the home page, just click on WinSig, which is over here on the corner, and you will get a page. Then we'll list all of the SIG meetings. Today's date is May, uh, May yeah, it's, uh, November 9th. 2014, so you go to that in the list, and it'll take you to this page. 
On this page are all of the topics that I have prepared for today, and these are links to them. So the third item on this list is the best free start menus for Windows 8.1. And if you click on this, I'm going to go ahead and tell it, I right mouse clicked, and I'm going to open it in a new tab. You'll see up here the tab is opening. And then I click on it, and there it is. There's the article. And then I can always go back to my list. So that's another tip for today. If you don't do this, always right mouse click instead of clicking on a link. Open it in a new tab. And then you can always go back, especially if you're doing searches in, in Google or you're working from a menu like this. You open in a separate tab. Go to that tab. Look at it. And then all you got to do is close the tab or just move from it back to your original list. So it saves you a lot of time, especially if you're looking for something in Google, and you're not sure which page to look at. If you open up several pages, you're, you're going back and forth and you're clicking the arrows and so on. You don't need to do that anymore. So that's, that's, if you learned that tip today and it's new today, that's worth attending this meeting. Okay, well, let's take a look at the uh, best free start menus. Uh, there are several. One is called Classic Shell, and it looks like this. Let's see if I click on it. Let's see if what it does. Some of these pages, when I click on it, it makes a bigger version of the picture. Some it takes me to a website. Some it doesn't do anything. This one doesn't do anything. Um, but it makes it look like Windows 7. So if you don't like working in Windows 8 and you want a start menu similar to what you're used to, and what you'll probably go back to something similar in Windows 10, you can install Classic Shell. And in this article, you'll see that that's blue and underlined. And as I move my mouse over it, it actually on my screen changes to a finger. It is a link. And so you can go to the page that describes it and download it from them. There's another one that I'm not familiar with called Anv1 Start. And it looks like this. So it's going to offer the standard Windows style start button and menu uh, uh, as well as a windowed version of your start screen. So you can make it look like Windows 8.1, but it's actually a start screen. The next one that they talk about is iobit start menu 8. And then there's start menu reviver, their vi start. Start Menu X, Start W8, Classic Start 8, which is one that uh, several of you I know will use. And that's from the same people that make Fences, Stardock. Uh, Handy Start Menu, and there's Power 8. And uh, the one I use is, uh, I think it's Classic Shell. It came on the computer. Uh, I bought my computer at Smart Guys Computers, and they automatically put a Start Menu on for you unless you specify you don't want it. So uh, I can't remember which one I have. I, I'm going to, you're not seeing this. You're seeing a, a hash box, but that's my start menu opening. And I don't know if it tells me what it is or not. It probably doesn't. But I, whoops, clicked the wrong thing here. Hang on, give me a second. Come back. Uh, but I believe it's classic shell. Uh, but these are, are different programs that you can use to make it look like Windows 7 if you want. Take a look at them. Take a look at the reviews. Decide which one you want and, uh, and try it. OK, getting back to uh, our list of things to talk about. Um, let's see which one I want to talk about next. I know, I'm not sure if Ted's there, but Ted always says, how do the spammers get your email address? And several other people asked me that as well. I thought this was a pretty good article. Uh, by the way, the articles I'm skipping are still good articles. I'm just not going to cover them right now. If we have time, we'll come back to some of them. Uh, but let's go ahead and open that in a new tab. And then go to that tab. OK, is your email address vulnerable to spammers? It can be maddening when your email inbox gets a fresh load of spam dumped into it. How are they getting those? Well, there's something called spider programs. 
And Google, uh, unlike what Google uses to index web pages, uh, they do the same thing. They go out and they just, this spider is a program that goes out and just goes through and finds all the websites it can find. But what the bad guys do is they scour these pages and anytime they see an email address, they collect it. So if your email address is on a website or on something that, that, uh, uh, that may be a web page somewhere, they're liable to have picked it up that way. So if you register to something, uh, uh, you comment on a website, you're on Facebook. Oh, Facebook doesn't use uh, at signs, but if, if you post something with, with it and somebody copies it to their website and so on, uh, they can pick it up. Um, if you have an email password that's easy, easy, get easily guessable, uh, spammers may hack into the email account and steal all the contacts stored there. If you've got a Gmail account and you use the same password to register on a website as you do for your email, you've now given the uh, good possibility of anyone who can get into where the passwords are stored. They're usually in a way the, web, the, uh, the owner of the website doesn't see them but they do have access to that file, and if they get run a program or if somebody else runs a program, they can get into that file, they can get your email addresses and the password associated with it, and then they'll try that password with your email address, and if you're using the same one, guess what? They've got access to your email. So don't use the same password everywhere, and especially don't use your email address, password, anywhere else other than for that email, and don't use it on your other email addresses. So if you've got two or three Gmail accounts, don't use the same password on all of them. Because if somebody gets the use of one of them, they then have access to all of your email programs or your email addresses. Uh, so this is an interesting article. Uh, uh, I just got a note from Home Depot. You know, when you go through Home Depot and you uh, log out, you, I'm sorry, you check out. One of the questions when, when you sign out is you want your receipt emailed to you. And if you say yes, you type in your, your email address. Well, now that email gets associated with your account at Home Depot. And Home Depot got hacked. So now anyone who has left their email address at uh, Home Depot or used a credit card, may, that information may be out there. So now they got your credit card number and they got an email address. So they can use that information, the possibilities they can use that information. Uh, so uh, Home Depot has sent out an email to all of the people and I got one today that said, please monitor your uh, accounts your credit card accounts to make sure that they no one is using them. And just recently, one of my Visa or my Mastercard accounts, I got a note from the bank saying we're sending you a new card. Your at this point, we have no uh, information that your account has been hacked. But to prevent it, the possibility looms, and they sent a replacement credit card with a different number on it, and I had to go to places where uh, I have monthly payments that come out of my credit card, I had to go in and uh, make changes with them to give them the new card number. So credit card companies are also aware of these things, but still to, to protect yourself and, and per, uh, be very careful with this information and don't use the same passwords everywhere. Okay. So that's an interesting article worth taking a look at, saving for your list. Um, okay, here's a warning that I think is uh, important for everybody. So let's go ahead and open this in a new tab. Um, I've got about 10 minutes left or so. And so we'll cover this and then we'll do some final things and and call it a day. So this one, uh, this is another great site, by the way. It's called How to Geek. And uh, they, they did an article on crapware 
finds new ways to trick users to install browser extensions. One of the biggest problem sites out there, let me make this bigger. Okay. One of the biggest problem websites out there now is CNET and their download.com uh, website. You have to be careful when you go to download a program, there's all kinds of, of buttons and free mouse auto clicker and special offers. That's, number, that's the worst problem. And that's not the only problem, but that's one of the worst problems is it, you can go to the wrong place to do your downloading because it's not where you download it. It actually starts another website to do something. For instance, with this one, uh, and then once you start, the, once you get the file and you start to install it, all of a sudden you'll things, see things pop up like this. Continue in your installation, but when you do and accept it, what you're doing is you're putting some kind of a mouse clicker in there. So you want to decline. So make sure uh, that when you're pushing a button, when you're installing a program that, uh, especially, and it doesn't have to be a free program anymore, but when you're installing a program, make sure that what you're accepting is installing that program, not a third party. Or sometimes it may, uh, you know, here's a confirm a new extension, add a new tab assistant. And if you click add to finish, you click add, all of a sudden you got a new extension in your browser. And if you're not expecting it. If you do it by mistake, you need to open your extensions and just make sure that you remove it. If it's a program that gets installed frequently, even Adobe Reader, even Adobe is resorting to this trick. And when you install it, if you don't watch carefully, there's a box that's pre-checked that says in, in, install a, uh, uh, a McAfee program. And when you say, OK, continue, not only is install Adobe Reader or Adobe Flash, uh, it, it installs a McAfee program, which you don't want, or most likely don't want. And what I always do is, uh oh, I did that again. So immediately go to the uh, uh, add and remove programs and tell it to remove it. But it's a hassle. And you, and you don't know if it's removed everything from it that you wanted that wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been installed. So be very careful there. Uh, run the Google Restore. Uh, this is for if you're using uh, Chrome. Uh, run the Google Software Removal Tool. Uh, and so an, again, another good article to uh, of things to watch when you're installing software. A reminder that there are a lot of programs out there that can cause some serious issues. I see somebody's trying to call me on my cell, and uh, hopefully it's not Jack. Uh, I'm presuming Jack, everything is ROC. As long as we're connected, we are, so it's not you. Okay. It's in the other room, and I'm not going to get up and get my phone. So if you're calling me, hang on for another 10, 15 minutes. I'll be back. Um, Here's another warning that I think is important. Whoops, I clicked the same button instead of opening the uh, in a new tab, but that's all right. We're getting we're getting time time to close down anyway. I got a few minutes, but ne uh, beware! Never download codecs or players to watch videos online. If you go to a website or if you're on Facebook and it shows a video and you click it and it says "Watch now" instead of having uh, the actual video, or if it says you need to install or you need to join this website to prove you're over 18 or whatever, don't do it. Don't do it. The problem being is that it may install something you don't want. It may install some uh, uh, malware or a virus, or it may associate your name in Facebook so you can start getting all kinds of advertising and pop-ups and other problems in Facebook uh, 
because you went ahead and connected that website to your Facebook account. So you don't want to do that. How they work is you should some uh, you could come across this sort of scam via a link on a social media or on a video streaming website. You won't find these ads on legitimate sites like Netflix or YouTube, but on lower quality sites, the kind of sites where you can stream pirated videos, for instance. You'll see some sort of an advertisement, a pop-up window, or a full page ad trying to get you to download some kind of malware disguised as a codec, which is nothing more than the ability to play a certain type of video file, or it's a video player, or it's a software update. So be very careful on these websites when you click a button, something pops up, you say, oh, well, I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be doing, and, and I'm getting this, I need to click on that and install it. No, you don't. Don't do it. So if you ever see a message like this one, don't click it. Uh, if you have, then you want to, uh, you may get a uh, Trojan or other malware, so you need to be careful. I see the microphone is on. Jack, uh, I'll take a break here, and I think we're about ready to close it up for some final questions. Okay. Are, are there any other questions? We have the microphone on, and you we can hear us, or we can transfer for it to them. Are there any other questions? Okay, you it looks pretty good. Um, okay, before I let you all go, right? Did this work? Does this work for everyone? And are we happy with it? Yeah, I think I think it works. And uh, basically, if you come up with a subject uh, under Windows, say, uh, I'm sure we can do it this way without any problems. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Oh, hold on a minute, Ewey. Sure. Go ahead. We have a question. Go ahead. Uh, basically, sometimes you get some emails or some where it says to uninstall. But I heard you should never uninstall. Like, like, just uh, put it into spam. What would be the proper way to handle that? He said that sometimes he gets an email and will say to uninstall something. And he said. What would be the problem? I probably wouldn't uninstall if it was something legit. If you got an, uh, an email that says to do it, and it's a particular program, I would go to, number one, don't click on a link in that email. Because it could be when you click on install, they install something else. They're not uninstalling something. The other thing, I would go to the website for a vendor and find out what's going on before I did it. Now let me, uh, I'm going to unshare this. I got to remember how to, uh, let's see, how do I have this set? I'm going to unshare my screen for just a moment. Okay, got it. It says share okay. my screen now. Right, now I'm going to share my whole screen. I got to see how I do that. Uh, okay. Desktop, there we go. Okay, I'm sharing my desktop. Let me minimize this, minimize this. So I, I, I've got a lot. Okay, I see you're seeing all of these things, and I'll minimize this as well. Hey, no problem. Okay, I'm in Windows 8, but I'm going to go to, and notice I'm using one of those uh, uh, Windows 8 uh, start menu programs. I'm going to click on Control Panel. In Control Panel are... Programs, I remember the alphabet, programs and features. Now click on programs. There's all the programs that I have installed on this computer. I find the program that I want, and uh, I'm not going to do it, so it doesn't matter. But let's say I don't want Dropbox anymore. Notice now this changes to uninstall. Then I click that, and it will uninstall it. It may be uninstall and repair, but I still, if I want to uninstall it, I click uninstall. If it doesn't uninstall everything, then you want to use a third-party program. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the one we use that we recommend. Anyone in the audience? Rebo. Yeah, Rebo. Rebo cleaner. Yeah, Rebo yeah. uninstaller. And, and that will do what this does, but it also makes sure that any, any information that's, that's needed to be uninstalled will be. Okay, folks, thank you very much for joining us. 
And uh, hopefully if uh, Jack has shown somebody how to set this up, uh, we'll get it set up again next month and we'll be ready to go. And for those of you at home, again, thanks for joining us there. Uh, please leave any comments. Uh, so I, I'm not going to totally sign, but I am, if I can remember how to do this, uh, I'm going to stop the recording.